Father God, we come before you tonight. We come to you as one. We want to worship you in this place. We thank you for your faithfulness in our lives, oh God. Though seasons may change, we thank you because you remain the same. And you will reign forever, oh God, as we sing this song. Lift up your voice. Worship Him in this place. I don't know what you're going through right now. But I want to remind you that He is in control. He reigns over our lives. In this country. In our families. Come on, you worship Him. Let's sing. To the Lamb upon the throne, hallelujah, hallelujah, to the Lord forevermore, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, lift up your voice and sing. Oh 
forever and ever. Yes, Lord, you will reign. Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for bringing us back here. You know, the things that we've, we've gone through. You know, some of us have struggled with so many things, especially during these many months, Lord God, um, from COVID to Odette and many other things in between. I thank you, Lord God, for bringing every single person here. You are the one who has called them, Lord God, back to you. And so we just thank you, Lord God, for giving us the grace to sustain us, Lord God, throughout all of these trials and all of these struggles. I pray for our time tonight, Lord God, that we would all be blessed after we hear your word and after we um, encourage one another, Lord God. So I just pray for our time tonight that your name, your name alone, would be glorified. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So... Uh, can we give a round of applause to God for, you know, for bringing us back here? And of course, um, thank you to the music team. I haven't had live worship in so long, you know, it feels so good. So again, uh, I want to welcome everyone. You could take your seats. Basin uh, ka na mo. All right, so good evening, everyone. Let me try that again. All right, good evening, everyone. All right, it's, you know, it's so, so good to be here, to finally be at North Drive. You know, I can't believe this day has finally, finally come. So for those of you wondering, from today onwards, for as long as there's not another uh, deadly variant, we're going to be meeting here every Friday, all right? So I hope you guys are excited for that, no? Again, as long as there's not another uh, deadly variant. So this really might be us going back to normal. And it's been so long that many of us might not even know what normal feels like anymore, right? Um, I think one of the things I've noticed is that COVID has made many of us an introvert, if not more of an introvert, right? Do you guys agree? Can you look at the person beside you? Have they become an introvert? <laughs> so again, I want to welcome everyone uh, to Big Fridays here at North Drive. It's, this is such a momentous occasion, so I'm really, really glad that all of you guys could be here. All right? So to those of you who weren't able to join us last week, which was uh, in Zoom, we're currently in a series titled Pili Pinas, all right? And this series is based on the Christian values movement. So if you don't know what CVM, as, as what it's called, stands for, um, you could ask the person beside you or definitely check out um, their website, you know? Um, but basically, CVM is a movement formed um, to pursue the vision of Christian values being lived out and embraced by leaders, especially government leaders, right? Now, maybe some of you guys are thinking, like, why, Tim, you know, after so long of not coming back to big, why, why this series, right? From all the series we could talk about, why this one? Well, first off, you know, um, 
elections is drawing near, so I think this series is very timely and important. And also, I've noticed that there are two groups of people. The first group of people are the people so passionate. You know, they really, really want to talk about politics. They really want to debate. Maybe you guys know someone like that, or maybe you're the person like that. <laughs> and the other group of people are the people who are somewhat lukewarm, right? They're not so excited to talk about politics, right? Maybe because they know that this topic is so divisive that they avoid it altogether. But finding the right balance is important, right? Um, because we are Filipino citizens. Actually, last week I remember someone actually doubted I was a Filipino citizen. So yes, just to clarify, I am Filipino, even if I look Chinese. Well, actually, I am Chinese, but yeah, I am a Filipino citizen, so that's why this topic is important. But also, first and foremost, we are also citizens of heaven, right? Before we are Filipinos, we are citizens of heaven, or we are Christians. Therefore, we are Filipino Christians, not Christian Filipinos, all right? And so with that, I hope that this series will help cultivate a healthy environment. Can you say that with me? Healthy environment. Healthy environment. All right. A healthy environment where we can discuss political opinion. All right. So last week we talked about God's design for good governance. I hope you guys were blessed with Pastor Ick's message and I think it was really, really great. Well, tonight we're going to be talking about leadership standards. But before we dive into the message, you know, I think it's very important that we understand that we have the right perspective and frame of mind of who government leaders are, all right? So in first, sorry, in Romans chapter 13, verse 1 to 2, it says this, everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in position of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. Again, this verse is so important to have the right perspective and frame of mind. The verse says that we are to submit and to respect all governing authorities, especially government officials. Why? Because their authority comes from God. It was God who placed them there. So if we rebel against them, against their authority, we are, in fact, rebelling against God. In other words, government officials are called servants of God, and we see this in verse 4, all right? It says, the authorities are God's servants sent for your good. So if government officials are God's servant, what then are their main responsibilities, all right? And we see this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 to 14. And it says, For the Lord's sake, submit to all human authority, whether the king as head of state or the officials he has appointed. For the king has sent them to what? What is their main responsibility? To punish evil and honor good. Again, now that we have a clear understanding of who government leaders are, right, that they are servants of God, and that their main responsibility is to punish evil and honor good, what then are the qualities of a good government leader so that we could all vote wisely for this coming election, all right? So I was doing some Google research on what top qualities uh, people find in a good leader. And you know what I found? A lot of surveys and a lot of different opinions. And so, I want to have my very own survey, all right? So let's make this part a little interactive. So may I ask Noreen to come up on stage? Um, so just letting you know, uh, what we're wearing does not signify anything, okay? Just a disclaimer. <laughs> to come up on stage and she'll be my assistant, all right? So she will help me. Now I'll be showing you 10 qualities of a good leader. So these words are just random and common from the things that I saw on the internet. And 
I want you guys, so I'm going to say each quality, and what I want you guys to do is to raise your hand if you think that these, that these three are the top three qualities that you find in a good leader, all right? So again, I'm going to say each quality, and then raise your hand. Again, we're Christian, so please be honest, just three times, all right? So your top three qualities uh, of a good leader, all right? So I'll give you a few seconds to scan through the words. And then I'm going to ask Noreen uh, to tally uh, all of the scores so that we would all know what most people think. All right, so again, that's charisma, communication, compassion, courage, decisiveness, empowerment, flexible or flexibility, gratitude, integrity, and vision. All right, so... Charisma, who among you think that it should be one of the top three qualities of a leader? Wow, really? No one. All right. Next, communication, meaning good at communicating whatever um, they believe. Could you raise your hands higher so that Noreen won't have a hard time? All right. Interesting. Next is compassion. Ooh. All right. <laughs> Next is courage, right? To face difficulties or against opposition. Three times, lang guys, huh? <laughs> no cheating. All right, how about decisiveness? All right, quick decisions, because there are some people who actually take forever to decide. Well, definitely if you're in a relationship, the guy has to be decisive. Next is empowerment, especially empowering other people. Ooh, interesting. Did not know that. All right, next is flexibility, willing to adjust to everyone and every circumstance. Oh, I owe you. I owe you hand. It's fine. It's okay. All right. Next is gratitude. Grateful to the people they're working with or grateful to definitely God. Hmm. All right. Next is integrity. Ooh. Okay, okay. <laughs> raise a hand or raise a heart. It's up to you. And last is vision. Right? As the Bible says, people who have no vision perish. How can you lead without a vision? All right, so we have scores. Drum roll, please. Can we have the top three? So starting from the third. So the third one with the highest um, vote is compassion. That's 24 of you who chose that. And then the next one would be the second one. The second highest is vision with 32 and integrity with 36. Wow. Thanks, Noreen. And thank you guys for participating. Can we give a round of applause to everyone? Man, I'm so smart. Those are actually my top three as well. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so as we can see, you know, uh, even as Christians, all of us have different answers and different opinions. Uh, but I think that there is no correct answer because I think all of these qualities are actually good qualities, right, for any leader. With that, now listen to this because I might say something controversial. I want to say that in the church, we all do not need to have the same preference for presidential candidates or qualities 
of a good leader. Let me say that again. In the church, I do not believe that we need to have the same preference for presidential candidates or qualities of a good leader. Now, the Bible has mentioned that diversity, not division, diversity is not a bad thing, right? Um, the Bible has mentioned that we all have different spiritual gifts, that we all come from uh, different backgrounds, right? Different social statuses, different ethnicity. And yet, we all follow and serve the same God. And it is that unity in diversity that we show the world, right? That under the banner of Christ, we are one body. But although we might have different standards when it comes to, example, leadership standards, right? I hope and pray that the standards set by the Bible should be or will be the bare minimum, all right? And what are some of these leadership standards that we find in the Bible? Although this is not an exhaustive list, I, I hope that you guys will agree with this, that this is a good list nonetheless, right? So here are the qualities that I find in the Bible. The first is character and competence. Character and competence. I believe that they should be together because having one but not the other just makes the person a handicap, right? In Exodus chapter 18, verse 21 to 22. So before I read the verse, just a background. This is when Moses was getting super stressed with leading the Israelites, right? And praise God for his father-in-law, his name is Jethro. He said, look, Moses, right? you're losing hair, you're so stressed. You know what? You need help, right? And so what, what did he recommend? He said, select from all the people some capable, honest men who fear God and hate bribes. Appoint them as leaders over groups of 100, 1,000, 150, 10, and they should be always be available to solve the people's common disputes. So again, here we see qualifications of what it takes to be a leader, right? It says there, capable, right? You need to have competence. You can't just have character. Competence is necessary for you to do your job well. Next is character, right? It says, honest men who fear God and hate bribes. Next, we also see this in Acts chapter 6, verse 3. And the background of this is, the disciples were also getting stressed out, right? They were saying, gosh, we have to do so many things in the church, right? We're also getting swamped. Uh, we need help, right? So that we could focus on preaching the gospel only. The other people can help us in doing the other church responsibilities. So they said, so brothers, select seven men who are well-respected. In other words, people who have good reputation and full of spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. So again, we see here from this verse, qualifications are both character and competence. Character because it says well-respected and full of the spirit. And then competence comes from the word wisdom, which is basically practical knowledge, right? They must be able to uh, do the task through God's wisdom. So again, we see here from the Bible, the, one of the qualifications for a good leader is both character and competence. Second is justice, or especially a strong sense of justice. Why is this? We just read earlier from this verse, right? In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 to 14, again, it says, For the Lord's sake, submit to all human authority, whether the king, as head of state, or the officials he has appointed. Because, again, what is their main responsibility? To punish evil and honor good. If this is their main responsibility, how then can they do it without a strong sense of justice, right? Only a person who has a strong sense of justice will be able to punish evil and honor good. The third quality is no to self-indulgence. And actually, I had a very hard time on <laughs> what better way to put a point. But we will see here in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 16 to 17. The background of this verse is basically the Israelites were telling God, look, God, we know you're our king, but, you know, we want to be like the other nations, right? They have kings. How come we don't have a king, right? And God's like, look, if you have a king, it's, it's not going to be good. But, you know, because you guys are so hard-headed and you really, really want a king, here are the qualifications, right? So basically it says, the king must not build up large stable of horses for himself 
or send his people to Egypt to buy horses. This might sound weird since we don't really have horses now, but I'll explain later. For the Lord has told you, you must never return to Egypt, right? The king must not take many wives for himself because they will turn his heart away from the Lord. And he must not accumulate large amounts of wealth and silver and gold for himself. All right. So again, in Deuteronomy, this is very um, strong qualifications. The first is the king must not basically have a large stable of horses. Now, you don't see a lot of presidents or government officials with lots of horses, I hope, right? Because we don't use them unless you're in carbon, right? Um, but horses were not owned by normal people. Actually, they were owned by rulers, right? And they didn't use them for just transportation, riding from one place to another. So it's not like cars, horses are cars, but rather horses were meant for military uses, right? They're basically tanks. So what this verse is saying is that the president or the king should not actually build up a super large army. Sounds very counterintuitive, but this is what God wanted. Why? Because he wants the king to depend on him, not on the army, right? Second, that the king must not take many wives. I think that's obvious because God right, wants one man and one woman only. The reason is because his heart will turn away from the Lord. Aside from that, you know, they are an example for the people to follow. So that's a qualification. The third is that they must not have large amounts of wealth. And that's why the point I used here is self-indulgence, because it's really all about themselves, right? About um, having lots of wives, about hoarding wealth, about building an army for their pride. So again, one of the qualifications is no to self-indulgence. It's not about themselves, right? Because as king, you have a lot of power all of a sudden. You know, you want to do things and gratify all of your desires. God is saying no. And the third is someone who is God-fearing. I think that is pretty obvious, right? Now, the reason why I use God-fearing here is because the reality is not everyone is a Christian, right? Especially the candidates. But we hope and pray that the person adheres to Christian values or better a Christian, right? Um, so there's no specific verse for this because all of the Bible talks about how if the person, right, follows the Lord and follows in his ways, they will be successful. And actually, even in Deuteronomy, God says here that the king must have a copy of himself, the law, or basically the Bible, and meditate on it day and night, and he will be successful, right? So these are the qualities of a good leader. Now, with this list, we can now better evaluate potential government leaders in light of God's word. But even then, you know, it can still be quite difficult. This is the reason why one of my goals for tonight is for us to practice discernment, right? Again, my goal for tonight is that we would all practice discernment. Discern with the help of the Holy Spirit who the good leader is. Because that's what the Bible also does, right? Hardly or many times, it doesn't really say, hey, you know what? This person is really, really good, and he did everything right, and so, you know, we should follow him. But many times what it does is it tells the person and what the person did. That's it. And it's for us to decide, to discern, to reflect if we should follow this person or not. And the story of King Solomon is a perfect example, and the Bible Project did a very great article on this. All right, so let's see uh, the story and life of King Solomon. So in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 25, it says this. During the lifetime of Solomon, all of Judah and Israel lived in peace and safety. And from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, each family had its own home and garden. Right? Wow. Isn't that amazing? Wouldn't you want to live... Uh, during the time of King Solomon, because when he was king, right, he ushered the golden age. Sounds familiar, right? The golden age of Israel. There was unprecedented wealth, fame, fortune for everyone, for the glory of Israel. But the question is, was Solomon a good king or not? From this verse, you know, it seems like it. 
But let's continue reading on. In 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 3, it says this, Solomon loved the Lord and followed all the decrees of his father, David. You know, one of the earlier, this, this is basically one of the early verses that describes Solomon and shows that he's someone who really, really loves the Lord and, you know, does his best to follow in his ways. He really seems like a good king, right? But just two verses before this, we read that Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and married one of his daughters. Is this a good move or not? Right? If you read Exodus 23 and Exodus 34, we read that God doesn't want Israel to have treaties with other nations. If so, then why did Solomon made, make such a move, right? Hmm. How do we make sense of these two verses, right? It says that, that Solomon loved the Lord, but then he also made a, a pact with Pharaoh and married one of his daughters, which God forbid, right? Well, let's read on. After this, Solomon had a dream, right, where God offers him anything he wanted. And what did he choose? As most of you know, he chose wisdom. In 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 10 to 14, it says this, The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom. So God replied, Because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and have not asked for a long life or wealth or death of your enemies, I will give you what you ask for. I will give you wise and understanding hearts such as no one else has ever heard or ever had will. And I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. And you will follow and obey. If you, and if you follow me and obey my commandments, as your father David did, I will give you a long life. Wow. Right? Solomon isn't so bad after all, right? Since, since God blessed him immensely, not just with wisdom, but with everything else. But as Solomon's kingdom grew, so did his ego. In chapter 4, verse 26, it says this, Solomon had 4,000 stalls for his chariot horses, and he had 12,000 horses. Uh-oh. Didn't we just read this earlier, right? That God doesn't want kings to have a lot of horses? How do we make sense of this? Again, discernment is necessary. Maybe for him, Solomon thought that it's necessary because he needs to protect his growing country. Again, how can we deny as well what God said? Now jumping to chapter 6, we read that Solomon starts to build a temple that even his father David wanted to build, right? In chapter 6, it says, The foundation of the Lord's temple was laid during the fourth year of Solomon's reign. The entire building was completed in every detail during the 11th year of his reign. So it took seven years to build the temple. If you read on, you will see all the magnificent details on how great this temple was. You know, Solomon really, really wanted this temple to be so great for God. That's why it took seven years to finish. It's amazing, right? He must be a good king. Surely he must be a good king. But then we also read in the next chapter, just a few verses later, Solomon also built a palace for himself, and it took him 13 years <laughs> to complete this construction. Hmm. How are we supposed to uh, interpret this? You know, Solomon's palace took way longer uh, than building the temple, and it was much, much bigger, twice as big, if I'm not mistaken. So it seems like Solomon is more concerned about his own palace than the temple, right? But Solomon also built his, the, the temple first before his palace, so hmm, what is it, right? Again, discernment is necessary. Is Solomon a good king or not? Now, if we go on to 1 Kings chapter 9 to 10, we will read that Solomon's many great achievements. Surely, you know, we're supposed to admire him right? He asked for wisdom, and God blessed him immensely with wealth and success. But then we go on to the great turning point of King Solomon's life, and this will be the last verse. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women, 
Besides Pharaoh's daughters, he married women from Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon, and from among the Hittites. The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. He had 700 wives, crazy, of royal birth and 300 concubines, can't even imagine. And in fact, they did turn his heart away from the Lord. Sad, really. You know, all that wealth, all that blessing, all that success we read earlier, which we thought were a sign of God's pleasure and blessing on his life, now looks very different. It actually looks like a sad and slow compromise that leads to his downfall. Again, the question is, was Solomon a good king or not? This is my goal. You know, I don't want to just say some qualities of a good leader and then let's leave. But rather, it's important for all of us as singles, as Christians, that we discern, right? If we think of a good king as someone who is perfect, we'll never find one, right? Only Jesus is perfect. Many times we will read in the Bible biblical characters who are actually a mixed bag. You know, some good, some not so good. Some examples definitely are Abraham, Jacob, Moses, David. All of these people were a mixed bag, right? We are then left to discern what things we are to follow and what things we are not to follow. The same is true for our presidential candidates or anyone running for a government position, right? Is blank a good leader? And I want you to fill that blank with any government official who is running for a position. Again, there's no such thing as a perfect leader. They will always be a mixed bag. And it is up to us to decide and discern with the help of the Holy Spirit who the good leader is. Right? Not using our own standards and opinions. Again, we use the standards set by the Bible. And what are the qualifications again? Character and competence, strong sense of justice, no to self-indulgence that is not about themselves, and lastly, God-fearing. These are the qualifications for a good leader. With that, I hope and pray that we would all do our best to research each candidate so that we could vote wisely, right? But also, let us not put our hope on one person alone, the hope of this nation. No matter how good they may seem, no matter how much you believe in them, right, they are still human and they will fail us. Our hope must be anchored in God alone. Our great comfort is that as Christians, God is in heaven and he is always in control, right? He is sovereign. That even if the future president or any government will fail us, God is in control. That is our greatest comfort. Not Our hope is not on any individual. As, and I want to leave with this point. As Christians, we must look beyond the government to God. We must look beyond the government to our God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we are just so grateful for you bringing us back here. And we thank you for your word. We know that this topic is very divisive, and a lot of people have a lot of opinions. But we know that this topic is important as Filipino citizens. And as Christians, we must do our best to discern wisely who the good leader is. I pray for much grace and much wisdom, Lord God, for each and every one of us as elections draws near. I also pray for our time tonight as we break out into small groups. I pray that your word would be our guide, that love for this nation would only come second to love for you and your people. So I pray that we would all have a blessed time tonight, that we would all be encouraged, and that you, your name would be glorified. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.